Hello, everyone. Welcome. On today's webinar, our esteemed panelists will share with us contrasting realities of reopening schools and understanding inequities to support the whole child. I am pleased to open the conversation. My name is Richie Russell, and I'm the director of Stanford Inspire with the National University System. Based in San Diego, the National University System includes four colleges and universities and a virtual high school that altogether serve more than 40,000 students. Its flagship institution, National University, is home to the Stanford College of Education, one of the top 10 largest master's degree programs in education in the nation. National University is also home to the Stanford program, including Stanford Inspire, which is an online professional development program focused on developing inspirational teachers, Stanford Inspire, which is a social emotional learning program that is evidence-based and is pre-K through sixth grade focused on building healthy relationships among students. And the Stanford Institute of Philanthropy, which trains fundraisers to develop and nurture donor relationships to advance nonprofit causes. These programs were developed and have been expanded by National University in partnership with visionary philanthropist T. Denny Sanford. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator, uh, Dr. Jackie Jodel. Jacqueline Jodel is Associate Professor and Special Assistant to the Dean in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. As the Principal Strategic Advisor to the Dean and Faculty, her area of expertise is education innovation, timely during these times. Prior to her role at UVA, Dr. Jodel was the executive director of the Aspen Institute's National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development. In 2016, she was selected as a Presidential Management Fellow, a leadership program for advanced degree professionals in public policy, and was awarded the Alumni of Notable Achievement Award from the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Dr. Jodel. Thank you, Richie. Welcome everyone. We appreciate you all taking the time today to come and learn with us. We are here today in difficult times. School communities, families, and educators are facing enormous challenges in the weeks ahead as we design schooling systems that educate students while keeping families and staff safe. Coronavirus cases keep rising at alarming rates across the country. And this comes at a time when many school districts are wrestling with when and how to open. We all know the complexities of school reopening is significant. And we also know that the consequences of not reopen, reopening uh, seem dire. The dilemmas are even more concerning when we factor in the equity implications. Internet access, parental support, social distancing, busing, students with learning disabilities, English language learners. The contrasting realities of reopening schools are dramatic. So we are fortunate today to have three perspectives on the contrasting realities of reopening schools. First, we have Dr. Doug Fisher, who is a, who is a professor of educational leadership at San Diego State University and a leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. As a leading expert on teaching and learning, he has published numerous books, won numerous awards, and has served as a teacher, language development specialist, and an administrator in public schools and nonprofits. Next, we have Dr. Tyrone Howard, who is a professor of education at the UCLA Graduate School of Education. Dr. Howard is the inaugural director of the new UCLA Pritzker Center for Strengthening Children and Families and the director and founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA. Dr. Howard has been listed as one of the 60 most influential scholars in the nation in forming educational policy, practice, and reform. Last, we have Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, one of the country's leading authorities on education, who is consistently cited as the top influential expert on educational policy. As the Charles E. Dukuman Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University, she is the founding president of the Learning Policy Institute and the president of the California State Board of Education. She recently received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Educational Research Association. 
So welcome to our panelists. We're so fortunate to have the three perspectives today, rock star perspectives, I may add. So let's, um, let's begin. Let's start with the most obvious question. And that is, how realistic is it for schools to reopen across the country at the end of next month when we're seeing this resurgence in the coronavirus? We know that at stake, there are a slew of competing and contradictory needs. We know that there's the need for children to learn, the need for parents to have their children engaged during the work hours, the needs for schools to implement and somehow pay for the new safety measures, and the need for everyone, students, teachers, and their parents to be safe. So Dr. Darlene Hammond, let's start, why don't you um, start the conversation for us? So how realistic is it for schools to reopen in a few weeks? Well, first I just wanna say, um, as the American Academy of Pediatrics has noted, it's important for schools to open when they can do so safely. Uh, and there are places in the country where schools can open safely. Uh, and we need to get guidelines uh, organized, both for, uh, in California, we're putting those out. Um, we've had several sets of them. We'll have another set tomorrow. We're putting them out regularly. What does it take, both in the community, in terms of the infection rates that may be in place at, at a moment in time, uh, and in terms of school processes and procedures? Um, but there are places where uh, COVID um, infection rates are relatively low, where they're not increasing at rapid rates, where um, safety features are in place in schools and they can reopen. And there are other places where <clears throat> right now it will not be safe for schools to reopen. We need a benchmark. We will have one in California announced tomorrow as to what that benchmark is uh, that is safe to reopen. Uh, and then a lot of guidance about how to do it. Within the school, once uh, the community setting is such that reopening is advisable from public health officials, then you need to be sure that there are um, ground rules around face coverings, around social distancing, around testing and tracking, and most importantly, around keeping small cohorts of children and staff together who do not intermingle with other cohorts which is going to be a particularly challenging thing to do in high schools, but uh, there are ways to do it and we'll help people with guidance around that. Uh, so that if the case does emerge, it doesn't infect everyone in the whole school, right? It allows for what other countries have done, which is quarantining the individuals in that cohort to make sure that um, they're no longer exposed and uh, you can make sure that they're getting the medical care in case they do, you know, um, show any symptoms um, and then uh, making sure that uh, people come back to school you know when everyone has been kind of cleared uh, and those kinds of things are going to become a new normal for us uh, but we it is important to start uh, school where we can it's also true as you said jackie that the equity dimensions are very serious that particularly for young children distance learning is difficult uh, and uh, there are kids who are not gonna be well-educated if they don't get back to school. And many countries have started elementary schools back soonest um, for that reason, and because the science suggests that children are rarely transmitters or vectors for you know, further infection. So uh, districts will have to have a plan A and a plan B and maybe also a plan C. Um, for this process and we may be in and out of physical schooling throughout the year um, and therefore we'll need you know, continuous learning plans as well. But when possible, we should support people in coming back to school safely. Okay, thank you. Um, Doug, Dr. Fisher, what do you think um, given uh, Linda's uh, level setting of the conversation, what do you think are the biggest risks as we as we go into the next um, several weeks planning reopening schools? Well, one of the risks is that the school becomes a super spreader and that our reputation in a community is that's the school that is the super spreader. And the long-term social capital of that school or that district will be compromised. But as, as she said, I believe that if possible, we should open schools. I happen to work in a district that has announced we will not be opening schools because 
our conditions here in San Diego don't allow it, it's not safe. Uh, and that is becoming a trend around the country is that Austin, uh, Houston, Prince George, there's places all over the country saying it's just not safe enough in our community to do this right now. <clears throat> and as, uh, as you heard earlier, everything we read so far says it's not the child to child, five-year-old, nine-year-old transmission. The risk is for the staff as well, is I don't want to be the principal who meets with a class of kids and says, your teacher has died. I've done that once in my career already. And the support and the counseling and the long-term loss for those children of, of their prince coming in and announcing that their teacher has died also has to be part of this conversation. Uh, my, one of my wake-ups was on, um, on a reopening plan from another state. In their list of documents, they had a letter to notify the, of the death of a teacher or the death of a student. And I thought, if we had to do that to plan, we really should think about whether or not physical opening is possible in that community. <clears throat> but your, your question says, and I'll let Tyrone or someone else talk, how realistic it is for schools to reopen? I think we need to redefine reopen. Schools will open, and we will do heroic things to ensure kids learn as much as we can. They may not reopen physically, but they will be open for business. All right, great. Um, Dr. Howard, one <clears throat> of the most important um, dimensions of this conversation today is the equity implications of reopening. What do you think are the most critical um, implication, equity implications of the various issues that we've talked about? So first and foremost, thank you for having me, Jackie. And it's an honor to be here with such distinguished uh, thinkers and doers such as Doug and, and Linda, but I, I'm glad you mentioned the equity implications because I think they're huge and they're and they're significant in ways that we cannot ignore. So I'm in Los Angeles, and and the Los Angeles Unified School District just came out with a report just this morning that showed that there were certain subgroups who were not connected with learning in ways that other students were, in terms of uh, online accessibility. And we know who those students were. They were poor students. They were African American students. They were Latinx students. There were students who spoke uh, languages other than English. These were foster care students, and these were students who were experiencing homelessness. That comes as no surprise to anyone. And part of the concern that I have, and I'm sure others who are equity advocates have, is that those are the same populations of students who, if we do not reopen schools, will continue to be at a disadvantage. So therefore, our gaps and our disparities will only widen. So I think what we've got to do, if we're truly concerned about the issues of equity here, we've got to continue to do what Linda mentioned is listen to the science and what the science tells us should, should, should dictate how we act and where we move, because we can't have a one size fits all approach because there's some spots that are far more dangerous right now than others are. We have to take that into consideration. But the safety of our children has to be number one decision making factor that informs how we decide to move. And then I like to see a third thing, which is how do we put together strategic plans that are really intentional around those students who have special needs, who we know they're at our dis a distinct disadvantage when they're not in schools. But also I wanna think about how we help support teachers in the online format. Much of what we are learning is that much of the rigor and depth and complexity of online learning is not in place in ways that we would typically see in the classroom. So that's another concern that even for those students who are logging on, what's the quality of the instruction that they're receiving, right? What's the depth of the kinds of content that they're being exposed to? Because even though they may be logging on, that may not mean that they're learning. So I think that equity in terms of access and opportunity has to be front and center on this because if we look at large districts like Los Angeles where I am or large districts where Doug is in San Diego, we know that there are overwhelmingly black, brown and poor children and we may, we may look back two, three years from now and say, well, how do we get these massive, massive disparities in outcomes? And we may be pointing to this period in time where we didn't act bolder and act more intentionally around our most vulnerable populations. Can you, um, let's, let's talk, we're gonna talk um, before the end of the hour on how to support teachers and how to think about the quality of, of instruction as we, we move to more remote. But let's, let's spend a couple of minutes um, thinking about just kind of dimensionalizing, illustrating what the contrasting realities are, what it looks like for those different, for different populations of students, because there are, there are dramatic differences depending on, on one's context. Linda, do you, have, do you want to start us out and then we'll have each of you comment on, the, on that? I'd be glad to. Um, you know, 
California is a um, state that is very diverse, uh, and I guess we're all here in California, so we see the different parts of it uh, right around our neighborhoods. But there are some kids who the first day when we closed schools in California, by the next week, 100% of the kids had their laptops, all of the teachers had their schedules, they were on the Zoom, they were in Zoom breakout rooms, they were doing chats, they were, you know, had their projects and they were actually engaged in productive learning. And there were other kids who had no computers, had no devices, about one in five kids in California was um, not connected to the internet before the pandemic began. We think we've closed that digital divide by about half, but we still have a distance to go because we've been working hard to get, you know, the devices and, and hotspots uh, set up for kids. Um, so you had kids who had no way to see a teacher, connect with a teacher. Um, they may have been, they might have gotten a packet from school. They might have had a way, if they could get to it, to get a, a lunch. Uh, you know, that was, there were places where you could pick up lunches, um, where uh, they may have um, had uh, people in their household who were ill. There are kids who are going to come back to school who've been just sheltering at home nicely, you know, with all of the accoutrements that you need for a very, um, you know, laid back existence and others who will have lost family members, who will have experienced illness in their family, who may have lost their home. There's a lot of homelessness that's growing, who may have been food insecure, and a lot of people have lost their health care as well. So you imagine the level of trauma that experiences that many kids are experiencing. Tyrone already called this out, you know, the same places where kids didn't have computers and, and um, connectivity are the same communities where uh, black and brown uh, families are uh, experiencing much more of the health effects of COVID uh, and don't have connectivity to get telehealth, to get Instacart, to get benefits, to look for a job. So uh, the, the dramatic disparities are going to be uh, what teachers see in their classrooms when they come back. And one of the first things we need teachers to do, uh, if they're in physical space or if they're in cyberspace, whichever it is, is to spend the first week or two just building a community with the kids, just making the connections, uh, doing the social and emotional supports, figuring out what kids have experienced, you know, letting them talk about it, write about it, uh, understanding what's needed, uh, directing other resources to the families that need them uh, as they learn about what's needed, uh, creating a community in which kids um, can experience caring and which they can also contribute caring to one another and building that kind of a framework of trust on which you can then begin to do some of the academic learning. Dr. Howard, do you want to jump no, in No, I, I, yeah, I think Linda is spot on. You know, I've talked to a number of teachers and I stress that part of our concern obviously is with the learning loss and lots of teachers want to jump back into the learning and get to the content and begin to get kids back up to speed academically. But I've said we've got to pull back a little bit and we've got to understand the, the severe amounts of social emotional distress that many of our students have gone through. I mean, many of them have lost loved ones. Many of them are, are, are also witnessing uh, significant stressors in their families because their parents and caregivers have lost jobs. Many of them are looking at evictions. Many of them are experiencing homelessness. So I think we cannot get to the learning until we understand the social emotional trauma that many students are going to be experiencing. So the more we can put investments in schools to get therapists and counselors and mental health practitioners to help our students the better. But I don't want to stop just at students because I think oftentimes missing from this equation and this conversation are those same supports for our classroom teachers. Our classroom teachers are also struggling with a lot. They've lost loved ones. They're trying to care for their own children at home. They've got loved ones that they're caring for, parents and, and, and elderly grandparents who might be living with them. And they're expected to sort of burden or, or carry the burden and responsibility of helping to heal others. So I think we're gonna have to put a lot of mental health supports in place for not only our students, our teachers, our staff, because we are we are witnessing something that's a once in a, in a, in a century occurrence where a global pandemic has happened and we've lost over 140,000 people. I mean, sometimes when you just sit with what that means and the numbers uh, of people who have lost their lives and the ripple effect that has had on lots of children, and I maintain that one of the things that concerns me is that frequently in many communities of color, 
there is a tendency to not really sort of understand the importance of mental health issues. There's a taboo sort of way in which we see issues around grief and loss. But I think we've got to start to demystify sort of the need to talk about mental health, demystify the importance of social emotional well-being, and begin to make sure that our students and our teachers are connected with experts and professionals who can help them because the levels of anxiety, uh, depression, sadness, anger, the full range of emotions are going to be on display in our schools. And my hope and my concern is that students who exhibit some of those behaviors are not punished or not excluded mm -hmm. by school personnel because they're not quote unquote behaving in typical ways that we see. So we have to enlighten and educate our teachers to say, you may see a wide range of behavior from students, but please do not compound matters by making a bad situation worse by excluding our children. So mental health, mental health, mental health has got to be uh, front and center of our reopening efforts. So Dr. Fisher, the, you know, your expertise in um, social emotional learning, so commenting on the whole child, whole teacher approach to reopening to build on what Dr. Howard and Dr. Darling Hammond are commenting on. So, so many things going through my mind. Um, when we closed school in San Diego, March 13th, teachers and their students had relationships. They knew each other, routines and procedures were in place we're not opening with the same relationships. So setting up our norms and routines and getting to know each other and like, do you know their names? Do you know how to say their names? Do you know things about them? I mean, that's going to be super important. You know, if I don't know your name and I don't use your name, we don't have a relationship. And mm -hmm. if I don't know things about you. So that beginning of school, I don't know that kids are going to be vulnerable and with their teachers and talk about the things that we've been hearing unless there's some trust that's built in the beginning of the school year. Because we are starting with brand new relationships in most cases. There are some districts that are going a looping thing where if you're a third grader, your teacher is going to be your fourth grade teacher now because they know you and they'll maintain some relationships. That's not possible with everybody because if you go from eighth grade to ninth grade, changing buildings. And then so. I think the relationships are going to be super important. And, and I think starting off on that to allow some healing, to allow some voice in it, it's going to be important. Um, I can, I've lost count of how many school systems have called me for help on their remediate plans of learning mm. uh, for I work in literacy. I'm very troubled with this conversation. Mm -hmm. Children are where they are and we are their teachers. And if we start talking about all the deficits, mm -hmm. certain kids will be labeled. And that is going to be disproportionate in the kids we're talking about with equity. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start talking to them about their COVID victims, their learning was compromised. Once that labeling starts, expectations suffer. Mm -hmm. You're a fourth grade teacher, mm -hmm. you got to start teaching fourth grade. Yes, mm -hmm. there are, I acknowledge, they lost a whole bunch of learning experiences. That's why we have small group experiences. That's why we do other things. We have to change the narrative from all the deficits that have happened to children because they will be part of their labels in the future if we don't change this narrative. The children are where they are. We are their teachers and our job is to teach them. Could I just add on to I'm so, um, I'm, I just want to, co-sign everything that Doug just said um, and add that in California, because we were hearing this conversation and some districts were kind of like, kids are kind of come, come back day one, we're gonna give them a test and put them in the yes. group, and label them and below <laughs> and above. So we put out guidance just about a week ago on formative assessment. And we mm -hmm. make a couple of points in there. One is that you don't need a large scale test at the beginning of the year. The first assessment should be social and emotionally oriented mm -hmm. and we should be taking care of that but also we don't want to label kids as above or below all the things you said about stigma are so true we want to figure out where kids are turns out that mm -hmm. california has a bunch of formative assessment tools that were previously approved many of them are for were approved for second grade diagnostics but they actually extend from kindergarten all the way up you know developmental reading assessment the um, you know, a variety of other ones that you can use. A lot of districts use these. Um, when they're ready to assess more formally, they can use these tools, figure out where kids are, where they are, and think about accelerating progress, but not mm -hmm. labeling, uh, stigmatizing, and remediating. It is um, going to be very, very important that kids feel 
that their assets are visible, that they that teachers have the time, as, as Doug said, to learn who they are and how they learn. Some places actually are gonna bring kids back with their teachers from last year and even uh, either allow them to stay with that teacher for the whole year in a looping way or stay for the first quarter. Uh, and then after they've gotten back and they've gotten supported, get passed off with care and knowledge and, and understanding to the next grade level teacher. So that's an interesting concept that I've seen in some places, but that relationship is gonna matter so much. And if that's not the way it's going to unfold, that teacher from the third grade should be given the time to sit with that fourth grade teacher and go through all of what they know about how to support each of the kids. And what do we know about how they learn and, and what we can do to, you know, um, smooth the pathway um, into the next stage. Go ahead, Dr. Howard. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with where Linda and Doug are going. But one thing I hope we don't lose sight of is the fact that while our goal is to get students back into school and to get back to those relationships and to get back to the learning, what I don't want us to lose sight of is the fact that as much as we may not realize it, this current format in terms of remote learning is working for certain students. And That's I hope right. that that is not lost in this process. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a number of students who have said, wow, uh, this gives me more autonomy. Uh, this gives me more independence. This gives me more flexibility. And these are typically high school students. But I hope we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We are going to have to come to grips with understanding that remote learning will have some place in how we think about schools moving forward. We have to begin to put all options on the table to say, do we have to go back to school as it was verbatim before March 13th? What I'm hearing from some high school students I work with is that, why do I have to sit in a class for for 50 minutes, five days a week, when I can do this online and I can be done in half as much time. Uh, there are students who are having to play different roles for their families, watching younger siblings. There are some young people who are having to work part-time jobs to help their families. So I think that virtual learning, as we're learning now, is working for kids once they have accessibility to the to the, the hotspots and the, and the devices that allow them to get online. And there are some students who have a host of other um, social emotional challenges where working alone is better for them because yes. of the, the kinds of pressures that come from being in school and the social format does not work for them. So again, we can't take a one size fits all approach. This format is helping some students thrive in ways that we could have never imagined and that cannot be forgotten. Yeah, right? and I'm hearing that as well from a number of people um, who work with special needs students who you know experience bullying in, in the classroom and they're doing great. Um, you know, when they're able to work at their pace in their way uh, online and so on. So it's, it really is impossible to paint everything with one brush. It is certainly true that it's not working for everyone and not everyone has all the supports they need. It's also true that if we can bottle the best of this, if we can figure out what is working, where the great teachers have invented things that are working and share those with others, where um, some students are getting supports that they might not otherwise have gotten, uh, we could really improve education. So I just want to uh, underscore. Let me, let me just, um, let's spend a little bit of time talking about what we know about remote or hybrid learning, but let me just summarize some of the key points here and perhaps we can get these up on the screen because there's some really critical um, points that, that you all have made. The first one is this whole notion of shifting away from a deficit framing of the reopening of schools, that we really need to focus on, on accepting students as they come and the assets that they, that they present. I think that's absolutely um, essential to what you're, what you're saying. The second point is this whole notion of focusing on the first few weeks as the social emotional you know, um, level setting of students and you know, you all have mentioned different um, approaches to doing that, um, different practices approaches to doing that, including looping and some other um, um, some other approaches. But those those things that as that teachers and principals start to consider as they approach the reopening appear to be like fundamental themes that our that our panelists are are focusing on. Um, now, if we if we shift to this conversation 
Um, and I should say, um, Dr. Fisher, do you want to comment on that? Because you were really the ones that, uh, really the one that uh, that really brought this to the forefront of the conversation. Is that good? Okay. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about the the remote hybrid learning. And I come to this conversation not as a K twelve teacher, but as someone who you know really um, was thrown in uh, in a, in my class um, at the University of Virginia, where I was told in a few days to shift online. And um, and develop myself as you know from an in person to an, an online teacher. So so given this whole notion that that this is working for a lot of students remote and hybrid, what's interesting about some of the research that has come out recently about um, distance learning is that it didn't go so great during the shutdown. Now specifically. Um, there was um, a report out of the Center for Reinventing Public Education that indicated that 82% um, of educators believed that student engagement dropped. There was some, another survey from EdWeek that suggested that only 27% of school districts required daily attendance. And then Learning Heroes, a nonprofit parent organization, um, has evidence to suggest that 22% of parents said in a survey that their children spent less than one hour per day doing schoolwork. So what, is, what do we really know about, or, uh, about remote, um, the effectiveness of our remote and hybrid learning as we approach reopening schools? Or what do we need to, to know? Do you want to, um, Doug? Or, or, Go ahead, Doug. Sure. Okay, so there have been meta-analyses on distance learning. The effect size averages at 0.17, and people say, oh, distance learning doesn't work. But if you actually read it, distance learning is no better or worse. The setting is not the decider here. <laughs> it's what you do with it. And so people are quoting these meta-analyses. Oh, the effect size is so low, 0.17, it's a throwaway. You're missing the point. Distance learning was not better or worse than physical school. It's what happens. To be clear, on March 13, we did not engage in distance learning. We engaged in pandemic teaching, <laughs> or quarantine teaching, as I wow. call it. Wow. Wow. Because distance learning is planned and intentional, and there's professional learning in advance. What happened, like you, is we were told to shift pivot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some systems were more ready than others so some kids got more time but i don't believe that there was anything like distance learning in the research that occurred on march 20th now we have time we have thought about it we have we know more about it we're learning about it so the fall has the potential to actually deliver distance learning mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And there were some places that were able to do some really good work because they were yes. already queued up and ready to do it. Some of them already had, you know, the technology tools. They'd been using technology tools in classrooms. Teachers knew something about it. They did get some training from their district, et cetera. Yep. And others got very little. But right. people are getting better. People are figuring it out. Uh, the tools, the curriculum resources, the strategies are getting more codified. Districts now have an idea about what they're doing. So it won't be wonderful everywhere, but it will be much better than it was. Uh, one of the things we learned uh, when at Stanford when I was doing a study on technology uses in education is that if you just use technology like an electronic workbook, you get no gain in achievement. You know, if right. you just have your kids march through a program. But if you use it as a tool in a setting where they're in, where the kids are using it for their purposes, sometimes they may be researching something and then creating a website that demonstrates what they learned, or they may have done an inquiry project. And then, uh, you know, I saw a lot of defenses online at the end of the school year last year where kids had been doing their community-based project. They finished their research. They did their exhibition on Zoom for everyone, you know, who then judged their, um, project and their uh, outcomes. They were engaged, they were learning, they were getting extra help behind the scenes, et cetera. Uh, they got a lot out of it. So it really is about the how, as Doug said, and we're learning more about that. I do think uh, that this concern about how am I gonna cover the standards can be a distraction. 
Uh, yeah, it's not like, okay, standard 3.2, I got to get through that this week and standard 3.3 next week. We've got to embed that in work that is meaningful and authentic that allows kids to really apply what they're learning. And then they will use that time outside of the Zoom classroom to continue their research, to continue their inquiry, because they'll be engaged, uh, they'll have enough support to pursue it. Uh, they may even be in groups that go into their Zoom chat room and do the work together in cases. Um, but we've got to create the setting in which kids understand what they're learning, why they're learning, how they're going to apply it, and then they will be able to take it further. Dr. Howard? Uh, can I add here? Yeah, I, I think Doug's point is so spot on, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad that we can address this for a moment because I had a, a conversation with the principal just last Friday, and what he shared with me is the fact that the, the remote learning did not sort of expose good teaching or bad teaching. He said the teachers who were phenomenal in the classroom are phenomenal in the online format. The teachers who I had deep concerns about in the classroom are the same ones I have the deep concerns about in the virtual format. Because at the end of the day, teachers who figure out how to engage kids, to inspire kids, to connect with kids, to check in with kids, are going to do that whether they're in person or in the virtual format. So I think that what we have to do is continue to find ways to build that community. Part of what I continue to see and hear from teachers across the spectrum is that the students who they don't hear from, they've got relationships in place with them, they know how to contact them, they're following up, there's phone calls, there's text messages, there's emails to parents, to caregivers, to peers, to see where they are, haven't heard from you, where have you been, haven't logged on. These teachers will do that whether or not they're on Zoom or whether or not they're in the brick and mortar setup. So part of what we have to do is continue to help our teachers who are struggling to say that the same things that you are able to do in brick and mortar, you can do by and large in the virtual format. I've seen teachers, I've dropped in on classrooms. I see teachers using Zoom where they're polling kids on questions of the day. They've got breakout rooms going. They have kids engaged in the, in the, in the <clears throat> chat room. There's lots of question and answer. What we have to recognize is that the amazing brilliance of our kids is that they have mastered multitasking. When we were in the brick and mortar, you would see students walking down the hallway with an earbud in one in one one ear, having a conversation with a peer next to them, texting to another one, doing multiple things at once. Well, guess what? Zoom allows for so much of that same thing. You've got the lecture going on on the main screen. You've got the chat happening over here. You've got another sidebar conversation there. Our children are able to multitask and learn in ways that are just beyond my comprehension at times. I think that the teachers <laughs> who get that tap into that. And the teachers who are just going to continue to complain about the fact they've got to do it online are the same teachers who are going to complain when they have the, when they have the students in person. So we've got to help to get those other teachers up to par to say, look, regardless of what the format is, we need you to think about teaching and what it looks like in your classroom. Yeah, just, to, just a, a word on behalf of the teachers for whom getting online, you know, really was partly a, a technology issue. Um, irrespective of their general teaching. Uh, I saw in, um, in Long Beach, they've been taking teachers who figured out the online piece and are well known for teaching certain things well and making their um, lectures slash classes slash discussion sections available to everybody in the district. So you've got sort of the exemplar teachers and there are more and more of them because more people are learning how to do this well. Um, 2000 kids could you know tune in and work through that quadratics equation, you know, um, unit together and teachers could tune in and see how it's taught. And they're going to have some teachers who are going to be demonstration teachers videotaped on a regular basis so that people can use this as a learning opportunity. The single most important thing we have to think about now is how to share what we're learning with others. How do teachers get to share with other teachers? How do schools get to share with other schools? Uh, because this is a moment in human history, which is, you know, an innovation moment, and we have to help support the spread of innovation uh, by making um, those who figured anything out available to those who are trying to figure it out uh, in a widespread way across states, across counties, across districts, across schools. Let's talk about that. the question that's coming up in the chat box is, you know, how do we create this, you know, this learning community virtually, or how do we share this learning? As Linda just said, this is the ultimate experiment, right? I mean, this, we just have to make sure that we're capturing this, and the three of you, as a, three of you as scholars, really 
how, how do we capture all this learning? How do we make sure that it, we, we capture it and then we share it? Doug, do you want to grab that one? Sure. So um, make one connection to what something Tyrone said earlier. So there's a model of student engagement um, that I particularly like, and it talks about moving from participating all the way up to driving. And a low level of his engagement is when students participate in things. A high level of engagement turns out when they're driving their learning. And mm -hmm. so this is an opportunity to switch from participating to driving and go all the way up to the high levels of engagement. And the evidence that's been published on this model of engagement says the higher you get up to driving, closer and closer to driving, the better achievement you get. So as he was talking about the experiences of kids in like a Zoom meeting, as we move them from participating to driving, they achieve more. Another connection that I keep reminding superintendents is, if you look at the research uh, going back to the hidden lives of learners and some of those uh, studies, somewhere between 40 and 60% of instructional minutes are spent on things kids already can do. Mm -hmm. We don't have time for that in distance learning. What we have time for is what they still need to learn. And so when, you, when Tyrone was talking about the high schooler who says, why do I have to sit here? Well, we have seat time requirements. That's why you have to sit there. But that got removed in, in large places. I mean, in California, the legislature and the governor, we have a, nef a different model for instructional minutes now. Yep. And it will help us do this. Uh, in terms of your question about capturing. Uh, so March 13th, when this all started to happen, uh, Nancy and I contacted a group of teachers, California, um, Hawaii, Alaska, and Texas. And we followed more than 70 people and captured video from their experiences, early attempts, coaching, getting better. And we just watched this change from novice, like what is Zoom, to oh, breakout <laughs> rooms, reaction buttons, all this That's stuff, right. and better and better lessons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that there are like these four moves that these 70 plus teachers do on a regular basis. One is they demonstrate things for kids. That can be teacher modeling, so, so demonstration. Another thing they do is get kids to collaborate because student to student interaction is still really important. Yeah. The third thing they do is coach or guide or facilitate or something like that. So as we were talking about some of our high risk kids, they need smaller little coaching sessions. That's right. And then things we've never really delivered in education is deliberate practice mm. because there's a gap between our instruction and getting kids to actually practice things in a deliberate way. Not as Linda was saying, battery operated worksheets, but <laughs> deliberate practice. And that's, if we can do those four things in online, if we can demonstrate, so a think aloud, a worked example, you know, a read aloud, I'll demonstrate. If we can get kids to collaborate, if we can guide when they're stuck, and if we actually get them to practice. I go to a lot of conferences, we all do. I see these folks regularly at conferences. <laughs> All the conferences around instruction, 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 instruction. We have to figure out how to get kids to practice mm. because practice makes the learning permanent, not perfect. Mm. Yes. And, and wow. if I could just add on to that, um, there's a piece of this, which is um, revi revising your work, you know, doing, doing a task, getting feedback. It might be through a rubric. It may be through other kinds of comments and immediately having the opportunity to redo uh -huh. that work. That's right. Retake that test, whatever it is, and doing that iterative process regularly. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a different pedagogy than coverage. Coverage yes. is you know mm -hmm. read a chapter, do the questions mm -hmm. at the end of the book, you know take a test, read the next chapter, etc. Mm -hmm. And you just keep going. And there's yep. actually very little practice in there. It's mm -hmm. you know listen and then output. Uh, yep. And there's no opportunity to get mm -hmm. it right. So the kids who then have less experience on something at the beginning, don't have the opportunity to practice more because they're not getting feedback and opportunity to revise and retake and redo. Um, they also are losing confidence because they get a C minus or whatever on the first one and they don't feel confident in it and they've never reached that. And then they take the next one and they start to say, I can't do this. I am not a math person. I am not a writer. I can't read. So we have to build in this idea of revise uh, and redo and um, build competence and confidence That's right. at the same That's time, right. which then builds a growth mindset, which is yeah. then a motivator. 
Yeah, I, I think I think Linda, you're spot on again with the confidence and competence. One of the things, and just let me be fully disclosing here. On March 13th, when I was told that I had to go remote, I was not happy about it. I had never taught a course online in my life. I was resistant. I was opposed. I didn't want to do it because it put me out of my comfort zone. But I have yeah. to say with the appropriate supports, I think I'm a Zoom master now. I would have never imagined three months ago that I would have become this way. So what I've told my teacher friends is don't knock it until you try it. And part of what we have to ask our teacher friends to do is the same thing that many of them ask their students to do. And Linda, you just spoke to it. You've got to engage in some productive struggle. You're going to have to try it. You're going to have a setback. You have to come back a second time. It's still going to feel awkward, but you come back again and you come back a second, third, fourth time. I'm asking my teachers who are saying they are opposed to this remote learning. How many students have you had who struggle with the concept? And what did you tell them? You gave them support and you gave them skill and you gave them practice. And that practice ultimately sort of moved into a point of mastery and perfection. It's the same thing with this format in terms of how we're expecting teachers to learn. Teachers have got to engage in the productive struggle. And guess what? Sometimes your biggest advocates in this are your students. Students know this stuff better than we do. So I've seen teachers say, look, I'm going to make student X the co-host with me. So if I run into a glitch here, guess who can help me to figure out how to navigate this? The very student who's in the classroom. So teachers have to be willing to put themselves in a position where they're vulnerable to say with students, we're going to learn this together. I'm going to mess up, but guess what? I'm not going to give up and I need you to help me in the process. What a novel concept because the same concept we ask teachers to give the students that they have to take risk. They have to take risk to build their confidence. And when that confidence is built, as Linda said, it builds competence. And you know, look, you're now a webmaster, right? I'm, I don't know if I go that master. far, but I'm but I'm better than I was four months ago. And young people have given me that competence. And so I think that we have to be willing to step out and of our think comfort zone. What kids will do with games, right? Yes. So when they get to yes. sit down and master a game and they can't do it, and then they, you know, and the games are structured to give them feedback so that they can continue. You know, that's what we want around the learning process. So this that's is right. a time to reinvent the learning process. That's right. To, every to time I get, yes, every time I get a new phone, I get the manual and my son comes to me and says, Dad, what are you doing with that manual? I give him the phone and he just goes through the process of doing things all on his own. I'm reading line by line, page by page, trying to figure out how to handle the phone. But he has a knack to just know how to push, explore, experiment and figure it out. And that's what our kids have the knack to do. Yeah. We have to tap into that. In the old days, yes. parents had children to work the farm. Now we have children to work our technology. Bingo. That's right. <laughs> just to, just to uh, build on what um, Dr. Howard is saying, in my course, every week I had three students who were assigned to help me with the technology, and they they were unbelievably helpful and knew the mistakes I was going to make before I made them and, and quickly corrected. So it was a great way to get um, get the students involved and develop some great relationships with them. All right. So so I'd like what I'd like to do now in our remaining few minutes is I'd like to ask each one of the three panelists a question that's surfacing um, among the um, among the, um, the 3,000 teachers and um, principals that are listening in. And there are a couple of themes, and I'm gonna start with um, Dr. Howard. Um, one of the themes that's coming up here in all the questions is, so, you know, how do we manage, um, how do we manage the, the getting rid of the stigma of of mental health not not only for students but also um for uh for you know co-work for the you know our co-workers and related to that is this mention of kids coming back with T ptsd symptoms and how can teachers best address and help those so so if you can tackle the the mental health theme that's coming in through the the chat box yeah, I appreciate that, Jackie. I think it starts by just us talking about it. I think it's been a topic of taboo that we just have not engaged in in this country is mental health. We see it as a sign of weakness. We see it as a sign of ineptness. And the reality is we're all touched by it directly or indirectly. And I think that it's okay. I know when I was a classroom teacher, I would walk in and tell my fifth graders, I'm not having a good day today. I'm pretty, I'm feeling pretty bad. And just me saying that, I think helped to humanize and help to make more transparent the, the fact that we don't feel our best at times or we feel sad or we feel angry. And I'll go one step further. Uh, part of this, and I, I get concerned about two populations. Many of our young boys 
uh, are oftentimes not willing to talk about the fact that they hurt or that they need help or that they're feeling a certain way because toxic masculinity is such that it tells young boys not to express their emotions and not to feel. We've got to dismantle that. We've got to tell our young boys it's okay to feel however they feel. And I'm deeply concerned about what social media does to our young girls in terms of how they have to sort of meet these notions of what uh, beauty is or what kindness or care. So we've got to find ways to give our kids the ability to say they feel, that they hurt, that it's okay to hurt. I maintain that we all probably can benefit from, from therapy. I know I do all the time. And I think it comes down to us talking about how we are oftentimes struggling with various things in our lives. And the more we talk about it, the more we model it. Uh, I see more teachers who are engaging in mental uh, health practices and exercise, mindfulness in the classroom, yoga in the classroom. I think we have to take steps to help normalize the fact that sometimes we are not well, and that is okay, but getting help is the steps that we take in order to get better. And I think everybody can, can embody that, model that, and demonstrate it. Thank you. That was great. So one of the other um, themes that's coming through is the um, is the, the theme of parents and how can we um, quickly, you know, how can we quickly bond with students as well as parents and how um, should, what can teachers and schools be doing to support parents? Um, Doug, do you want to, do you want to grab that one and, sure. and comment on that one? Sure. Um, I don't know about quickly bonding. That's where I'm struggling. Relationships take time. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really worried about this student teacher relationship thing online. And one of my friends reminded me, people meet their spouses online now and have entire relationships. <laughs> we can develop relationships online. We can do this. It takes time. It takes honesty. It takes commitment. It takes paying attention. Yes, we're on a webinar now, but I keep looking at these people people I care about. So watching them, you know, that's what we have to show. Empathy, compassion, care, trust, and they, and that will happen. Those relationships will come. I think the other part of this question is how can we support parents to help their kids? And I think that's going to be a major lift for school systems is uh, I, I'm a proud, in our district, we ask parents, what's hard for you to teach at home? And we will ramp up the lessons on that because if there are things that are easier for you, you can do that. And writing came through loud and clear. Parents in elementary did not know how to teach writing. So we ratcheted up the number of lessons on writing because that's what the parents needed from us. Now, I think we have to say to parents, you don't have to be your child's teacher, but don't tell them the answers. Here are some prompts you could use or cues you could use please get them to watch this. And if they don't understand it, and we've introduced different A sounds and how A gets controlled by vowels or whatever we're teaching in first grade, here are some practice things you can do. We're not asking you to teach the A sounds, long and short A. We're asking you is once we teach it, could you practice with them? And I think if we start thinking of that relationship there, we actually could have even better learning than we thought we could get last year. Yeah. I would like to last comment on the research on this. When you look at, John Hattie did a review of other school closures. So fires in, in Australia, the earthquakes in New Zealand, Katrina has been studied, Puerto Rico has been studied. There has not been proof that learning is lost in any of those school closures. Now there, none of them are a pandemic, but the effect size of the event is near zero. It's because the teachers, dive in and they focus on what the kids need to learn right now. And they did not waive state testing. Now I'm hoping we do waive state testing, Linda, but they did not waive state testing in New Zealand. And for the community that had this huge earthquake and they closed schools for like 11 or 12 weeks or something like that, the kids did just fine. Yeah, yeah. Because their teachers did the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Linda, so Dr. Darling Hammond, do you want to um, bring us home here um, as one of the um, countries or really the world's leading experts on, on teacher quality? What, what is your message to all of the teachers out there? What should teachers be talking to their principals about and their district leaders about as these plans are being put together? How can they most advocate for themselves and their students and, and our schools in this process? 
Well, I think part of it is being in a school setting that supports what you do. And sometimes that may mean redesigning the school setting. I was thinking about the parent question. Um, a lot of schools have gone to having um, a home visit or a, uh, an early call for parents early in the school year. And for elementary school teachers, that might mean 20, 25, 30, such things. But the, the um, school has to make the time, pay for that time, figure out how that fits into the schedule so that that parent-teacher relationship can be started with the student. Mm -hmm. And in high schools, you need to have an advisory structure. The comprehensive yeah. high school in which kids have no home base but they see eight teachers a day and they run around for six periods and so on, it's not gonna work now for just about anybody. Um, so mm -hmm. the schools that have redesigned have an advisory system where one of the, if a teacher teaches four or five classes a day, depending, uh, or even two classes a day if it's a block schedule, but one of the things they do as part of their load is an advisory and they're responsible for 15 or 20 kids and then they can reach out to those 20 parents and every kid has an advocate and every parent has a contact. Those kinds of things support teachers in caring effectively for their kids. If you're in a setting where as a teacher you want to care effectively for your kids, but the design of the school and the supports that the school provides don't enable it, it becomes extremely frustrating. And that's one of the things I'm hearing from teachers is that they do care. Um, and I was a high school teacher, you know, and we had 180 kids a day and we didn't have any kind of teams or advisories or anything. Uh, you cannot care effectively for 180 kids who have trauma, uh, you know, yourself. You have to be in a team that's organized to allow you with your colleagues to care effectively for your kids. So that's one thing, is to pay attention to using this time to redesign schools so that they allow you to do your job more effectively. We're seeing that in schools that have redesigned, uh, kids are having better experiences now even to the pandemic and uh, the uh, capacity of teachers to get help from their colleagues because they have shared planning time built in uh, to get help from their uh, colleagues who are specialized in mental health and other things to work with their teaching team is better. The other thing I would just say to teachers is be uh, forgiving of yourself and others. Uh, yeah. Don't worry about whether you're meeting every standard and checking every checkbox. Think about the most important things that you want kids to learn. Those are going to be both uh, traits of character um, and how they approach things and developing that growth mindset and, you know, having some of the resilience that we want them to develop. And they're going to be uh, academic traits. Uh, they're going to be the skills that you carry from year to year. Uh, it doesn't matter if you, you know, read every chapter in the book, but if you've deepened your ability to read and you've developed your ability to write, you're going to carry that with you uh, across the grades. Uh, and it's not essential that you do as many activities. It's essential that you learn deeply the things that are habits of mind and then habits of the heart. And be forgiving of kids and yourself as you undertake that. And of course, the parents. Wow, okay, what a great way to end this conversation. Um, I want to thank the three of you. Fabulous, fabulous um, webinar. Just great learning for all. Uh, well, a shout out to Sanford um, programs. We'll, hopefully, we'll bring us all back together. I would. I, this is a this is a personal request to bring the four of us back together at some point during the fall, so we can kind of, you know, level set, reconvene again as schools are are underway. But um, such a great conversation, deep, um, lots of lots of learning, and um, so filled with hope. Uh, so I thank you all for that. So thank you all for attending, and I wish you all. Um, the best uh, the best health and and the and, and to you and to your thank you everyone great thank to, you see you all. All. Good to see you thank you all take care